uh, proceed with assembly member Spitzer item 17 AB 2109 thank you mr. chairman I know this is being televised, so I'll try to stay on mic, um, but I have some posters that I think will help uh, demonstrate this issue that I'm presenting in 2109. <clears throat> I think the, this committee knows, um, as well as many others in the legislature and the administration, that uh, after we passed AB 900, Mr. Chairman, the bill that you authored about a year and a half ago, myself and uh, other members of the legislature have been inextricably involved in how we're going to implement AB 900. Last Thursday, I was invited to a three-judge panel meeting, the federal court that's looking at the early release plan. And there's two judges who are negotiating on behalf of the three-judge panel, Justice Siggins and Justice Louis. And there are many facets that we're now examining with respect to a settlement agreement on early release. And I'm, as you know, Mr. Chairman, obviously, I've talked to you about this at length. Um, you and I are uh, deeply involved in this, as well as reentry and other programs. As I've been doing my research, the reason I wrote 2109 is because I discovered that um, there's three levels of parole supervision. You have level one, which is the parole agent who actually supervises a parolee within the parole office. The next level is the unit supervisor who supervises the parole agents within that local office. Then you have, outside of that office, you have what's called a regional administrator that supervises multiple offices. Under corrections regulations, if I, as a parole agent, have a parolee, and I, after, under Penal Code Section 3000, they mandatorily have to come up for review after one year. Normally, parole is three years, generally, sometimes five, but generally three. Every parolee has to be considered for parole after one year under Penal Code Section 3000 for certain crimes. What's happening is the parole agents are reviewing the record and determining that their parolee, in their opinion, should remain on parole. And the department uses this form. These are two different forms. It's called an activity report. It's form 1502. The parole agent recommends either discharge or retain. The unit supervisor, right, the next boss, has to review that and either agree or disagree. If both of those individuals, the parole agent and the unit supervisor, say retain on parole, in other words, we shouldn't discharge after one year, this person needs to continue on parole, they are not allowed to do that under the regulations of the Department of Corrections. In other words, you or I have our staff, but if we want to keep our staff in employ, under, we, we can't do that, say for example, without going, not to the speaker, because he would be our direct supervisor, it'd be, we'd have to go like the lieutenant governor, who doesn't know anything about our offices or our staff. So in the Department of Corrections, they have one of the most least likely individuals making a decision about somebody to be retained on parole or not. And this is what happens. It's a one-way street. If I want to keep somebody on parole, I don't have the authority to retain them as a parole agent, and either does the unit supervisor. Only the regional administrator who is overseeing multiple offices can make the decision to retain somebody on parole. But if you want to discharge, oh boy, we want to discharge as many people as we can because we're trying to reduce recidivism on paper. Because if you don't have people on parole, you can't violate them and you're going to reduce your recidivism and then everybody's going to pat themselves on the back and say, wow, we've reduced uh, recidivism in the state of California. Why? Because we keep people off parole. It's a fiction. So this bill says, look, if the unit supervisor and the parole agent say retain on parole, we shouldn't let a regional administrator um, discharge without the consent of the unit supervisor or the parole agent. And that's what CDCR is doing today. So let me give you two examples. Donnie Vargas was sent to the prison for, um, Donnie Vargas was sent to prison for vehicle theft, 10851 of the vehicle code. <clears throat> The parole agent and the unit supervisor said retain on parole. Mr. Carnegie, the uh, regional uh, administrator, he whited out, you can, it's hard to see on this, but you have the original documents that I gave you as part of my supporting documents. He went in and whited out the boxes that says retain on parole and wrote discharge uh, as a matter of law. After we caught Carnegie doing this, they did a, an audit of Carnegie's cases, and they went back in and put the, some of these people on parole, but 
not every, some people had been discharged and you couldn't get them back on parole. You can't just walk to somebody's door after you discharge them and say, now I want to put you back on parole. So after we caught them, they did that. But that's a horror. In this case over here, Chester Johnson, he embezzled $100,000 from his parents, elder abuse, $100,000. He made no restitution to his parents after he got out of prison, and they discharged him after one year. In fact, there's a memo in the Department of Corrections written by the head of adult parole, Mr. Hoffman, that says restitution, if you owe a victim money, that is not a reason to keep somebody on parole. And I'm not saying, after three years, I'm not saying, you know, we wouldn't discharge him necessarily beyond the three-year period. But you should give somebody earned discharge, early discharge off parole, when they haven't reimbursed the victim their restitution? That's outrageous. This is going on every day in corrections. So a couple things about the... I know that there's a recommendation for the Democrats against my bill. I, uh, obviously, apparently, there's a support by the Republicans. Let me put some things in context. I went with this evidence to JLAC, which I sit on, and the JLAC did give me an audit now of every region, parole region in the state of California, because corrections audited region one as a result of this scandal by Mr. Carnegie, Carnegie in region one here in Northern California. But we don't know right now in the state of California how, how widespread this practice is statewide. We don't know if it's happening in San Francisco or Oakland or Los Angeles or Stockton. We don't know that, or in Orange County, Mr. Chairman. We don't, we don't know. So we are going to get that evidence, and Ms. Howie is doing that audit. So this is what I'm willing to do. I need this bill to be a vehicle for whatever recommendations are going to come out for the JLAC audit. I understand why there might be some reluctance, and I know there's a cost potentially associated with my bill, obviously. But that's up to me as an author to make my case to appropriations. Because people recognize that I'm one of the lead people on this public policy discussion in the legislature. And I'm not going to let it go because it's offensive to me, Mr. Chairman, that victims are being screwed out of their restitution because parole is trying to get people off parole. A woman and a man, a parents, 87 and 91, it's right there in the explanation, 87 and 91-year-old 90 year parents were ripped off for $133,000 from their son, and they were... He, he was discharged after one year. One year should be a gift, right? It should be something like, okay, you're low, low risk and we want to make you a productive citizen society. But when you have, owe money like that or you're found with burglary tools, in this case, why do they want to keep, why do they want to keep Donnie Vargas, a, a, a vehicle thief, on parole? Because he was, found with, he was arrested with burglary tools. Mm -hmm. it, burglary tools are the, the things you, you use to pick locks. And he's a car stealer. So what do they do? Oh, no, that's not a big deal. He just has burglary tools. But he, he steals cars. Maybe that's the instrumentality of how you steal cars, because you're in possession of burglary tools. And this is our great Department of Corrections kicking these people off parole. So what I'm asking is, I'm asking to keep, let me get this JLAC audit moving. It has about a four to five months estimate. I know that in appropes, I'm going to have some major issues. But, I'm, but allow me, as the author, to carry that burden. What I'm saying is a matter of public policy for this committee, the question before this committee is, is it good policy to let corrections overrule the recommendation of the two most important people in the evaluative process, the unit supervisor, but most importantly, the parole agent? And so I'm asking you to let this bill go out of committee, and I'm making a commitment to this committee on the record, that if the JLAC audit comes back and says this was an aberration, just one, one rogue regional administrator in unit, uh, region one, then I'll drop my bill. There's no need for my bill because it's not a widespread pandemic problem within the Department of Corrections. But if the audit comes back and says, hey, this is a practice that is being abused in every region in the state, then we need a vehicle to fix that. And this bill is the subject matter bill for that matter. So that's, I submit on that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, any witnesses in support of the bill? Good morning, Dawn Sanders Kepke on behalf of Crime Victims United of California in support of the bill. Um, as Mr. Spitzer indicated, parole agents are best suited to determine um, the suitability for um, discharging an individual from parole. Crime Victims United very strongly uh, agrees that they should be the ones making the determination, as Mr. Spitzer indicated, not someone that is not intimately involved with their case and uh, individual's oversight. Um, and we would just concur with the additional statements he made regarding restitution. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you.
John Lovell with the California Peace Officers Association and the California Police Chiefs Association. We're also in support of the bill. We think this is a good sense approach. 